good evening. Uh, as we are recording this, if that's okay for everybody. Um, we will, we have a YouTube channel. So for those who can't join us, um, well, they can't actually hear that. So that's silly of me to say that <laughs> right here. Okay. So let's be serious. I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, uh, have the second iteration of our convergence lecture. Um, I keep smiling because I see so many um, uh, familiar faces from different parts of the world. This is really nice. Um, so uh, nice to see so many of you for the second uh, uh, part of the lecture. And uh, I am very pleased, of course, to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Claudio fantin um, who is, in fact, uh, joining us, well, at least officially, from the Gutenberg University of Mainz, Germersheim, one of the very well-established um, centers for research and translation in Germany, my old good old <laughs> um, home place. Um, so very nice to see you here. But of course, Claudio is in fact pretty much a global academic and also somebody who is at home in academia as well as in the industry. So Claudio is a trained conference interpreter um, and uh, also the founder of Interpret Bank, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And recently, Claudio has also been appointed as the head of innovation of KUDO, which I'm sure also many of you have heard about, the one of the simultaneous interpreting platforms, um, which is why I was asking you on which side of the pond you are <laughs> at the moment. And um, yes, so as we like it in our lecture series and in CTS in general, Claudio's research is very firmly situated at the interface of interpreting and technology. Um, those of you who are I know a little bit more about Claudio will notice, of course, starting from uh, Claudio's research on computer assisted interpreting, Kai Claudio, one of the early pioneers in this field. And uh, now, of course, moving on to or expanding that um, by combining this sort of now even more traditional field with uh, new work streams in AI, NLP, speech recognition, speech translation, so everything that uh, emerges and emanates from that. Um, everything we are very interested in, of course, and Claudio's talk, um, I'm sure will reflect this today, Claudio's talk on human machine interaction in the interpreting workflow. Um, if I can say something well, sort of that stuck in my mind, when I, when I heard Claudio speak for the first time, and I can't really remember where that was, but um, uh, one thing that certainly stuck in my mind, because it's always been something that is close to my chest as um, being somebody who is, of course, also very interested in the field of technology and interpreting, is that um, you were emphasizing, wherever it was, you were emphasizing that uh, one of the important questions really is how we can make technology work for interpreters. So it was all in that preposition <laughs> for interpreters rather than working against them. And um, yes, that was a little while ago when AI wasn't so prominently on the research agenda um, yet as it is now. So I'm uh, really, really interested to hear and hope to hear today your latest thoughts on that and how this happens in the, uh, in the world of AI. So with that, the floor is all yours and uh, I really look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation for your kind uh, word. Um, Yes, indeed, AI is a big topic, maybe also a little bit on the hype uh, on the one side, on the other side is uh, uh, clear to everybody that many things are changing uh, around us, not only in interpreting, of course, interpreting is coming its way also in embracing uh, um, AI and technology. I will share my, um, my screen uh, with a very short PowerPoint presentation, even if I am um, a very a, a person which is very near to technology, I actually prefer just to speak without PowerPoint. But uh, I know that uh, nowadays PowerPoint is are always a must. So I have a very short PowerPoint bringing some a very few aspects of my talk. And my talk is about human machine interaction in the interpreting uh, workflow. Um, I would start, uh, um, uh, pa, 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 pa. let's go uh, full, just a second. Uh, so um, let's, start, let's start with uh, this uh, citation, with this, which comes from uh, a report that came out, I, I think, last week or two weeks ago, which is called The Dawn of the human machine era. 
And there is a, a sentence uh, which uh, I think is very uh, telling, which says, the human machine era is coming soon, a time when technology is integrated with our senses, not confined to mobile devices, which, which is a little bit very, very uh, science fiction, if you like. But what is very interesting uh, is that, that this sentence is found in, uh, it's very small to read uh, on my slide, but from a report which states a forecast of new and emerging language technologies. What it says, um, I invite you, it's a, uh, free and available to read it, it's available on, online. Um, it's a very good report, actually, in my opinion, uh, with a very strong component of uh, technology uh, experts uh, talking about this. What is very interesting is that uh, we see a dawn, a starting, something which is coming, bringing language technology in every aspect of our life, not only professional life, near to the people, which also means that this may, I believe in this, may apply to interpreting uh, too. Um, and this is the topic I will uh, try to uh, tackle uh, today from uh, the perspective of human interpretation. So um, let's, let's uh, uh, define my very short agenda for today. Even if the title of my talk says human machine, air, human machine interaction, you normally think about user interfaces and user experiences where they talk about how humans interact with machines. Um, it is a very fascinating talk, uh, topic, um, but in the area of interpreting is a very emerging topic. So we don't know very much which is very natural because there is not much human machine interaction or there has not been so much user machine interaction until recently. I will discuss the topic of human machine interaction from a very more broadly uh, perspective, uh, if you want. And then we start putting into context AI in the field of interpreting. Um, and my focus will be, uh, goes a little bit along the line what uh, um, has been said a couple of minutes before, uh, that I will focus on the supportive aspect of using artificial intelligence in interpreting versus, which will not be the uh, object of my talk, um, the automation, the full automation of the, uh, the interpreting activity, which is speech to speech translation, speech to text translation and so on. Um, I will try also to, to, to answer a little bit how we can uh, use in AI in the field of interpreting, as I said before, as a supportive tool. I will describe some prototype, prototypical uh, application uh, that we are working on or that can be envisaged for uh, the, the, the month or the years to come, um, explaining some possible use. I will look at empirical research, which has been done so far, not much, I have to admit. And then I will uh, give you an outlook and maybe some implications, some risks, but also potential of the use of AI in, uh, um, in interpreting. Um, I don't know if you see also my face, not that I'm a nice face to be looked at, but I really don't like if you only see my presentation, a little bit boring. Uh, let, let's hope you see also my, my, uh, myself talking. I would like to, to, to start giving you a context. Um, and there is no doubt nowadays uh, uh, that interpreting and technology are uh, together in some in some way that interpreting maybe we could also try to say is in some aspect technology driven or based if you want or uh, supported at least um, this is true now but it will be even more true in the years to come i'd like to draw some analogy very quickly uh, with the industrial revolutions huh? and apply this 
in a very broad and uh, maybe uh, easy way to interpret it. And we can probably define C3 uh, uh, revolutions uh, in interpreting related to technology. We have the first one, we all know it, about a uh, wire system that uh, allowed uh, the, 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 the emergence of uh, the simultaneous interpretation as we know it today, so meaning uh, in some way uh, the birth of a profession with a big a capital P, uh, not as an activity, but at least as a profession. This was more or less 100 uh, years ago. But then we have a second uh, technological revolution, which is what we are assisting at the very, at this very moment, we are at the completion of the second uh, technical revolution, which started um, 20 years ago, maybe, uh, with uh, uh, the digitalization of our, uh, our, of our life, of our working environment. And this has, of course, affected interpreting uh, already, as I said, 20 years ago with the new means of communication, with emails, and all these things that changed indirectly, but changed uh, interpreting as we, know, uh, as we know it now. So shorter time to an event, which were very different uh, 40 years ago, and through technology and through changes in society through technology, uh, they um, also, uh, the, 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 the habits of the interpreting profession changed. I think very easy to think about how we access information, our knowledge. Um, we have had in the last 22 decades uh, easy access to information, or at, le at least a different access to information than before. And it's, of course, clear that such changes change uh, the, 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 the picture of, uh, of interpreting. And of course, there is, uh, not caused by the pandemic, but accelerated by the pandemic uh, in a very clear way that for everybody is seeing this movement through more technology use, for example, with uh, the uh, remote interpretation in every uh, setting, simultaneous, uh, not simultaneous, and, and so on. And you see now, this is a, a picture uh, from uh, an interpreter, it's quite telling because you can see the level of uh, technologization around the providing of uh, an interpreting service that until a couple of years ago was almost logical to be provided in person no matter about the differences in cultures, uh, in the modality, uh, and so on. But nowadays, even simultaneous interpreting, which has been the interpretation for which resisted the longest, uh, this, this technological change has adopted it. And at some point after, after the uh, uh, pandemic, it will come to a certain uh, um, balance between in presence and not presence. But this is not important. What is important is that interpreting has changed in some way, even if the core activity of interpreting may look the same, all the surrounding has changed a lot. The second technological revolution is completed. There is no more uh, than this as far as this technological revolution, the traditional, let's call it nowadays, a technological revolution is concerned. But we are approaching a third technological revolution, uh, which is um, um, AI-driven um, revolution, that compared to the other ones, uh, leaving aside, as I said before, the, this drive of the pandemic that accelerated from outside the interpretive world, just because the world uh, changed. Um, this third technological revolution is faster than the other ones, and believe it or not, we will see it uh, pro probably more pervasive than the other ones. Um, this third technological revolution will mean that we will have AI tools, uh, no matter what we uh, think about AI or what we mean about the AI, but we will have AI entering 
any aspect of interpreting uh, um, activity and every aspect of interpreting per se meaning not only the interpretation or the tools AI as a supporting tool for human interpreters, but we will assist very soon also to um, the automatic or machine interpretation called speech to text or speech to speech uh, translation that we will, will be part of the bigger picture of uh, uh, of interpretation, meaning multilingual communication in real time. If we talk about supportive tools, which is my uh, topic, we will see that this human machine error in interpreting, at least this is my uh, expectation, will be something which is even more fundamental than the other two revolutions that we have seen. And we know that each revolution causes a lot of frustration, uncertainty, and so on. And we have just, or we are about to digest uh, the second uh, revolution that a third is coming um, upon us. And why it is so important for interpreting to understand this for, for the interpreting uh, community or the interpreting uh, activity uh, per se. Um, it is uh, because we're talking about artificial intelligence as it is now, not as it will be in 10 or 20 years, not as it is depicted by um, by science fiction, but as a tool which is already available now. And here, before I go into uh, artificial intelligence in interpreting, is it very important to understand one concept, concept about artificial intelligence, which is actually a machine learning, meaning the ability of a machine to learn by examples, uh, nothing more than this. It means that Artificial intelligence nowadays, as it is now, and in provision as it will be in the next couple of years, five years lifespan, is able to solve problems um, without the need to be intelligent and without the need to imitate humans to perform in certain areas, of course, in a certain specific and um, very limited area, better or similar or even better depending uh, than humans. This is very important to be understood because there is a misinterpretation or a, a, a little bit, um, in, my, in my humble opinion, about the magic that human perform with, uh, with language, which is magic if you want, it's, it's a fantastic uh, cognitive uh, capacity, and the impossibility of a machine to replicate some aspects or the entire process of language, just because we consider it something which requires human intelligence. Now, I don't open, of course, uh, the topic of about what is intelligence, and we should try to define uh, at least what we mean by intelligence to draw some comparison with machines and so on. But it's important to understand that we can do a lot without the machine being intelligent, without the machine displaying anything that we consider as humans an intelligence way to interact with the world through language. This is very important to understand as a concept. But this is very important, and this brings me to, to, to interpreting, because artificial intelligence and machine learning excels in, in some way uh, in language-related tasks. And again, meaning it excels, it doesn't mean it behaves or shows uh, the uh, abilities of humans, or it shows some form of intelligence, as we naturally think about intelligence. But nonetheless, it shows very, very um, um, high level uh, 
capacity of performing language-related tasks. That said, which for me is a very important uh, starting point, a little bit of a forecast which may uh, come true or, tough or not, but it's very general. So when we're talking about interpreting, and of course interpreting is based on language, and language is the means where we start talking about interpreting not only as a language-related activity, because there is much more than language in interpreting, we know, but language is an aspect, uh, uh, would say a very important aspect of the interpreting activity per se. And if machine can perform some way very good with languages, then machine learning and artificial interpretation, intelligence in interpreting will manifest themselves. And it's very important, in my opinion, to understand that these emergence will not come from one moment to the next. So tomorrow we will have perfect uh, tools for interpreters to be used, but would be um, a progressive um, permeation of tools in, in the interpretive world. Another very important aspect, that this will not happen in isolation, meaning it will go by or, or develop itself uh, together with other development in the same field. Think about, my, my topic is again, supportive tools for, my, for human interpreters. But this will go along with the development of what I call uh, machine interpreting, normally, again, speech to speech or speech to text interpreting. And it will go along with uh, the, the, the consolidation in some aspects of the professional world of the remote interpreting no matter if it's simultaneous, dialogic, or whatever. This is very important also to understand. They are no more separated items, but they, are, they interact and they develop themselves in, in some way in parallel or more than just in parallel, but together. And the, another point which is for me very important uh, to point to is this is that the advancements uh, in uh, um, interpreter and AI interaction, uh, at the moment that we are speaking, is more a question of embracing this technology rather than the technological challenge. What I mean is that the moment to speak in, there are already a lot of potential potentials, a lot of technologies as they are now, that could be already implemented in uh, the interpreting or uh, interpreter workflow, and they do not require a little a, a big break breakthrough to be to be used. They require more the time to for the community, for the professionals, if deemed necessary. In some cases, in other cases, uh, there is no way out uh, to embrace that. This is another uh, important with a thing which I think it's a, it's a, it's important important. So, um, if uh, uh, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence in uh, the human uh, um, the human based uh, interpreting, meaning again the supportive uh, aspect of using technology to deliver interpreting services, I would say that the three areas of interest uh, are uh, three, uh, as I said before. The first one is the event management. So to match demand and offer, something that we human are very good at, but that in some areas where there are a lot of um, demand and offer to be matched, think about big institutions or big players uh, in the, the, the market. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, there uh, for, for, for that, uh, to uh, mm, improve um, the, 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 inc the demand offer uh, matching. It works like more or less like your Netflix or Amazon uh, video, or how it's called, uh, the service, so that the machine learn just from patterns to match uh, availability, uh, knowledge, 
progressive knowledge of interpreters. Humans can do that very, very well, but machine can do that uh, too. The second area is, of course, to prepare language resources to digest prior to an event, which is basically the preparation uh, of an event, which we know it's a key in interpreting in any form of interpreting preparation is important. As we move from the old uh, preparation in the uh, library, maybe 40 years ago, we move to online searching information on the web. Uh, we move uh, by using uh, online tools for that, uh, uh, think databases and so on. Of course, nowadays, language, um, artificial intelligence is able uh, to create uh, resources, think very easily to think about this, uh, create a glossary uh, about a specific event in an automatic or semi-automatic way. The third one, which is the aspect I'm more interested in at the moment, is the integration of technology, AI technology, with the live interpreting process, so the in-process phase of interpreting. And this um, has to do with, okay, can apply to simultaneous interpreting, which is, of course, the area where most of the people, myself, is working on, but at the same in any other setting of interpreting, probably even more successfully than in simultaneous interpreting. So I will focus on this because the other two are, of course, very interesting, especially the second one, the preparing of language resources, uh, but the the human machine interaction is not so central as in the integration of a machine of a tool while we are or people are interpreting. So I will concentrate uh, on on the on the set on the second one. When we're talking about in process interpreter machine interaction, we have three if you want, we can reduce it to three areas where machine uh, can uh, interact with the user. At least there are many other, many probably not, but there are a couple of others, but I concentrate on three. Some of them have been already explored, some not, some are the beginning of being explored. The first one is to suggest interpreters uh, what they, we can call problem triggers, or I call them unit of interest, which are typically point-wise, very important, and there's a point-wise problems that can manifest during interpretation, especially simultaneous interpretation because of the time constraints, but actually in other uh, settings too. We're talking normally about numbers, we're talking about terminology, we're talking about entities, need proper names. This has been explored. Uh, there are prototypes, there are several projects uh, going on creating uh, tools to suggest interpreters, like a prompt. We'll show you a video in a second. And um, this will also. Um, make a little bit uh, the, 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 the contribute uh, to change uh, uh, the landscape. Um, I will give you also some uh, insights about the research in, in this. There is some preliminary exploration, but not very much, uh, to be honest, in looking at what happens if an interpreter has the access, access uh, can access um, real-time uh, transcription of the event. This is, of course, very easy to understand the idea, the basic idea, if I'm interpreting, as I can do an interpretation with a the text. There is a very interesting paper uh, without technology, technological support by Zeba. Uh, but what, what happens, it can have a tr transcription uh, running in front of me. Not very much is known about this. Unexplored and very uh, interested in some ways is the use during interpretation of speech to text translation. With speech to text, we mean we don't have this transcription of the original, but we have a machine translation 
of the speech of the original. And also here, there are some projects going on, but we don't know very much. So let's concentrate on the first one, which is where people research and, um, of course, companies are concentrating on uh, at the moment. And there is a lot of interest in this. I'm working on this in Kudo. I worked on this in the first uh, ever uh, prototype on Interpret Bank. The European Commission is working on this. There are other projects uh, from other groups uh, working on this. So it's um, the topic, the hot topic at the moment. Um, first of all, uh, let's go a little bit inside the technology. What's, what does it mean to have to create a, a tool that prompts uh, the interpreter with some aspects of the original speech? Hmm? Um, it means like this. It, 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 we have, um, this is a diagram to simplify uh, how such a tool works. You have uh, the original speech, or the dialogue, whatever. Um, you have a real-time speech recognition, meaning uh, in real time, words are transcribed. You get the transcription in real time. Uh, then you have a language model at the, at the moment. This is what we are doing uh, now. Uh, a language model is nothing else than a repository, if you want, of uh, knowledge, uh, not programmed by anybody, uh, collected and uh, trained, um, that is able to do some specific actions while the transcription is unfolding. So with, if you want, with every new word. Uh, the language model tries to identify what can be a named entity, a proper name. You can imagine that a proper name, at least for me, as a, when I worked as an interpreter, was a very difficult. Um, if I didn't know the name beforehand, so it tried to identify the proper name. It tried to identify the terminology the terminological units in different ways, the numbers and the, 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 the parts, reference of the numbers. So if you're saying 20 years is a year or something like this. So it means that we, we're working with machine learning, which is not no rules, uh, but this knowledge, aggregation of knowledge in a language model. Then the language model extracts in real time, these units of interest and show them in a way that we are research, doing a research how to present this information to the interpreter. Of course, we, I guess everybody is um, an expert or knowledgeable about interpreting. If you're interpreting, you're already working, at, not at the limit of every time, but very often at the limit of your cognitive capability, you, you can modulate a lot, but of course, um, presenting something new, in integrating something new in the uh, life experience of, a, of an interpreter, especially simultaneous, but not only, requires a lot of work in understanding what kind of information should be presented and how it should be presented. What is very important is that nowadays you have language model. This is the AI as it is now. You can have language models already trained and you can download them. And it's very easy at the moment to integrate them inside any technological pipeline. The problem is, is that these language models are general language models and they do not cover specificity of a um, specific uh, setting a specific event, specific people talking. So there is a need to customize these language models, which means nothing else than add a new layer if you want a knowledge of specific knowledge to both the speech recognition, which uses a language model and an acoustic model at the least. Um, you have to customize 
the speech recognition so that, for example, if somebody, uh, Zabida, said my name, which is very complicated, even for my uh, for the people in Italy, my, my teacher, uh, when I went to school, the first day had problems to read my name, my, my surname, because it's quite long, it's not very common. You can imagine a machine will have problems to read it. But if you customize the language model, teaching uh, this name, the machine will not have any problem at all. So you need to customize the language model with some proper names, with specific terminologies of specific fields. And the same, you have to do it also for the second language model. The language model takes out information out of the stream of this transcription. If you do this, the quality of your units of interest uh, are quite high in terms of precision and recall. Uh, let me show you a short video. I hope uh, that the audio also works. Uh, a short video, oops, just a second. Is started. So uh, the uh, audio should work. This is, for example, um, a big a prototype of uh, an automatic suggestion tool that we um, created specifically for an experiment we are we did a couple of months ago with Bart de Frank of the Euro of the Gent University with the European Commission. I will talk about this a little bit later. But just to give you a gist of what can mean to have a simple tool. This is a very simple tool, but based on machine learning. So just have a look. Uh, the, the, the girl is uh, playing the, the speaker, and what you see is actually uh, your booth made if you're a in simultaneous interpreter or your computer if you are uh, working in another setting. Okay, just, I just heard that there was no audio. I'm very sorry for this, but you can see, um, you can share later the video uh, on, uh, on, on the chat, but you can just imagine uh, the, the uh, speaker who's speaking in, in real time with some latency, you could have the uh, terminology um, displayed in this prototype in the terminology box and the numbers with the um, with some reference in the number box. Um, this was just to give you uh, an idea of what is possible now. Uh, to be honest, this prototype we, that we just uh, modified for this experiment is three years old. You can imagine that now we can do much better, but for many reasons I'm able just to uh, show you um, um, to, to show you this this one um, okay um, now I'll go to the next slide this is one possibility the other possibility because if you read if you read the the, 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 the um, the literature at the moment, actually, if you talk about AI, you read only, you, you, first of all, you don't read very much in interpreting. Now, this is the first point, which I try to change in some way, because it's a very important topic, in my opinion. If you read a few things about AI uh, in interpreting, you read it in the context of interpretation, of simultaneous interpretation. The context of dialogue, dialogic interpretation is very similar uh, to the simultaneous one, not because the, the activity of interpreter is similar, but because this kind of support 
I think, uh, would be uh, similar. But there is other possibility to use uh, interpretation, uh, sorry, uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, as a support for interpreters. And one is in the area of consecutive interpreting, which is quite fascinating, uh, fascinating one. Um, now imagine that you have a speech, somebody, somebody speaker speaking, and you take in your notepad, uh, iPad, iPad and so on, your notes on the right, on, on the left side. On the right side, this is synchronized with the transcription. Uh, nowadays, it's very easy uh, to, to, to do this, the transcription. And then you get some lookup mechanism, as I've uh, I showed you before in the video, but in the context of consecutive. For example, the example is probably not the best one. I, I agree with a conversion of uh, dollars in uh, Europe, but you can imagine this about uh, other uh, values, uh, distance, uh, for example, or even maybe there is a need for some reason to convert a uh, uh, currency into another one, whatever. The, reason, the, 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 the real reason may be. But you get this kind of support and you get, for example, the cross, the red cross was myself, uh, um, saying that the interpreter, for whatever reason, wasn't able uh, to jot down the second number. And then you have then, of course, it's consecutive. You can always ask, uh, always probably not by many cases, in most cases, maybe uh, the, the speaker, but there might be no need to do it if the tool uh, would just give you this number. Or imagine the second example where we are at a technical uh, meeting and you have a technical sentence that you prepared very well, uh, as always is preparation important. But then you get this uh, pop-up that I cannot simulate now in this uh, diagram, but you get just while the person is saying a specific term, you get this automatically suggested if out, for example, your glossary, specific glossary, uh, suggested um, for you just to jot down as uh, like a note, uh, like your note taking, but it's already uh, the terminological unit. Uh, to be clear, um, when I'm talking about this technology, the first, first objection objection that I receive is that interpreting is much more than numbers, is much more than terminology, is holistic and all this, which is completely right. However, interpretation is also numbers, it's also point-wise elements of an information. If I'm, I work most of my career in Germany as an interpreter, and in Germany I was a technical interpreter. And I could not go interpreting uh, without the right terminology and not using the right terminology. And there are many reasons why uh, you cannot use the right, the good terminology, because you don't remember it very easy, because you're tired, because, because, because. And this doesn't, the, the, the help that this can give you doesn't change a bit all the holistic approach to interpreting, it integrates it. If you look at the example before, the first uh, problem or the first reaction that people say is that, yeah, but I cannot look at all the terms and integrate them while I'm speaking. The question is, you don't have to. Uh, this is a support, meaning if I need, for whatever reason, to use some suggestion, I will. And I will show you or explain you that there are ways nowadays to make also these kind of suggestions more personalized. But imagine it's quite common that you work for um, a customer that nowadays and more in the future, because with the quality is improving in our interpreting world, I guess, maybe I'm wrong, but even the requirements for interpreter will be more stringent. 
why we will have machine interpreting coming for low level stuff at the beginning for things that are not interpreted in any case later also for uh, things that could have been interpreted but they are not interpreted uh, if i or if a client will pay the interpreter they will want even a higher quality i guess than before and many clients for example they want the use of a specific terminology not because the other way to say things is wrong because this is corporate uh, this is mercedes-benz wording and not pwm and so on you learn of course uh, but you also know that market is moving into a shorter preparation time in some aspects not in all aspects and if this is a bit of concerning if we are talking about quality and all this stuff this kind of tool can a little bit compensate these changes um, again about technology um, and coming slowly to, to an end um, the, the most important technology of course in everything related to interpreting is speech recognition of course machine translation also too but speech recognition uh, a tool for an interpreter based on speech recognition asr automatic speech recognition will be a combination of automatic speech recognition or integration into a computer assisted interpreter so what what we have uh, at the moment um the speech recognition world let's say is improving very fast we have the word error rates it is difficult to give you numbers because there are so many implementation on the one side changing very rapidly and on the other side interpreting is so different every situation is completely different that it's difficult to say this is what we have in this error this precision of these tools we can apply this and we know how it works it's very difficult but we can say something very very broadly uh, speech recognition the base of all technologies ai technologies in interpreting as a lower and lower word error rates meaning the number of errors that it does while transcribing it goes from three in perfect conditions three out of 100 uh, so three percent errors meaning 97 percent spot on uh two x this x is very difficult to quantify it depends from audio very interesting the audio quality is not only important in remote interpreting for humans but it's also important for a machine of course it increases this error uh, with the accent um, even if machine don't have any issue with accents as we don't have any issue with accent if we learn to cope with a specific accent but of course machine can have problem and has problem with accents i remember one of my first simultaneous interpretation in germany was interpreting for an Austrian guy coming from Wien, Vienna. And that was a nightmare for me. Fortunately, there was the colleague of mine uh, from uh, German mother tongue, and she helped me a lot. After a couple of days, I could cope with it. It's quite similar uh, to quite not the same to uh, automatic speech recognition. Then we have to do with speeches, oral speeches, which are not well packaged piece of texts. Texts. So we have disfluential aspects, which are not only the mm, yeah, yeah mm, but they are also in the grammar, in uh, the syntax, in many many aspects of, um, of, of a speech. This is a big problem for speech recognition, or a problem, a challenge. And then there is an informality grade in some aspects, at least in some areas, which is very difficult for a machine to cope with. A machine can cope very well with formal 
staff just because they learn from former staff. Um, very important is latency nowadays doesn't play any role. Uh, the, the, the speech recognition or, or not a big role. Uh, the latency is very small, meaning the time of reaction time of a machine is slow. And if you want to integrate it also in the simultaneous modality where latency plays a big role, the ear a voice spam uh, has been proved that even the, the pro my prototypes of three years ago, they were fine with that. Now, the aspect that nowadays most of speech recognition engines are cloud-based for many reasons, and this may approve a, a challenge for many aspects of interpretation where confidentiality and so on plays a role. It depends, again, from culture, very different from uh, Europe to, to, to other parts of the globe. Um, but this is um, when we have technology uh, related at the moment. Then we have the K2, which means is the language model uh, that I saw I show you in the middle, the, the, the model that listens and uh, to the transcription or reads the transcription and takes out some information out of it. We can have a, a, a proper lookup. So you have your glossary and you uh, and the language model looks up your set of data, your glossary. And here you have a PR uh, precision recall, which are two metrics to measure how good a system is, which is almost near 100%, no matter if it's misspelling or different spelling, no matter if it's plural, singular, no matter whatever. This is not a problem for a language model. Then you have a second possibility for term lookup, which is you don't have any language, uh, any glossary at all, and you let the, uh, the tool uh, guess if something may be something which is which poses a difficult for the interpreter. Um, so real time, if you want terminology extraction, this is com more complex, it's doable, we are doing it. Uh, but again, it's not a problem of the technological side, it's a challenge, but the big problem is what does the interpreter needs uh, as a suggestion? And can I define what the interpreter needs? It's very difficult. I would say it's almost, the, the answer is almost no, because the, the differences among interpreters for background, for approach, for, for whatever, is so difficult that everybody would tell you something, I will need something different. But there, there are some convergences where you can say, okay, it looks like this term poses a, diff a difficulty or, or is interesting for most of the, of the users. But this customization, this user customization of a, a tool would be the next frontier uh, in the years to come, making the tool learn from your uh, interpretation, so to say, from your past issues that you had, and let the, the, the machine learn from these so that the suggestions are more uh, calibrated, if you want, on your needs. This is something that we are not working on. I'm not working on this, but it will come uh, sooner uh, than, than later. Then we have okay, other, other values or uh, things where it's difficult to, to foresee or, or, or predict uh, precision. But maybe what is important in this technology is a little bit like machine translation, uh, sorry, in speech to text translation, where you have a speech recognition and a machine translation uh, concatenated. Here you have a speech recognition and a suggestion, so to say, generator concatenated. The challenge is that you have a propagation of errors. So if something is not understood by the speech recognition, you have, you cannot, in many cases, you cannot uh, recover it uh, later. This is the reason why the customization that I spoke before is so important. But if this is a little bit the, the general uh, what, what we are now in, in terms of technology very, very broadly, uh, let, let's have a look at what happens 
to interpreters when they use this interpretation uh, suggestion. Um, and the reference here is to, to simultaneous interpretation, uh, just because there is only research, uh, as far as I know, at least in this area, but there will come other research in other settings. Uh, we have done, or other people have done, uh, several uh, experiments. Uh, here I summarized two experiments from the University of Ghent and Mainz and University of Trieste and Mainz, where I was involved. Um, and what we have here on the left, uh, there, there would be, there are papers on this with many details, but I pick up some, just some, uh, uh, some data just to give you the idea of can this help or not. Um, we had a, an experiment when, where we had a complete transcription uh, running in real time with the numbers, for example, uh, highlighted. You know pretty well the numbers in simultaneous interpreting, especially are very um, an issue. Uh, if you look at uh, corpus data, uh, there is a quite high percentage of errors among professional interpreters. Errors or uh, strategies, sometimes it can be a strategy, not to say a number, of course, and to generalize. Hmm? But let, let's say uh, now, without going into too much detail here, um, we could see that, for example, in our population, there were students. This is very important. Uh, the very late uh, stage of the master, but there were students. We could see uh, an increase of the precision from 77, 67, sorry, to 90% um, of complete and correct renditions or omissions, which again could be strategies, but let's call them now omission, from 15 to 3%. If we had only digits, the suggestion that I, saw, I show you before without a complete transcription that the user said it's distracting. We had an increase from 60 to 85%. They are very similar. Uh, the differences are not so interesting here because every uh, experiment had some particularities. There were not replications of the same experiment. And omission again from 23% to 8%. If we add terminology, we've seen that the complete rendition using the right terminology, not always a requirement, but think about the client that wants the terminology to be said, otherwise they will complain. An increase from 49 to 77%. So uh, this shows the three, the two things at least, that you can use such a tool while you're simultaneously interpreting. First thing. The second thing, is that there is an improvement, measurable improvement in these specific aspects, um, not in every other aspect of the interpretation, in this specific apps, uh, aspect. Does it mean that interpretation is per se a better interpretation? Not. But in this aspect, yes. So other research should be done to, to englobate, englobate other aspects of interpretation. What is important to note, uh, limit, uh, one of the many limitations when we do uh, empirical research on interpreting, because there are so many variables and so on, that one is that we had students. So we did the same experiment a couple of weeks ago with the SCIC, uh, with a two language combination, um, around 20, 30 interpreters, and we are now evaluating the results. Um, my expectation, you can be wrong, is that we will have an increase which will be smaller than this because of the bigger experience of the interpreters. But again, I expect an improvement in this aspect, terminology, precision, and number precision. There are many other uh, things going on at the moment in research. Um, very interesting to notice is much of the research is coming from China at the moment, or Hong Kong, China, and Asia and generally. And we in Europe are, or in America, nothing that I know of, and in Europe a little uh, bit. And 
also here things are uh, expanding, as I said, told you before, from measuring how this interaction will work with suggestions to also a, a proper real-time translation. And to, oops, to conclude, um, what are the future challenges? Div let's divide it into areas. One is the technology and one is the interpreting side of the equation. From uh, the technological side, the machine learning side, we are slowly, very slowly moving from, let's call it natural language processing to natural language understanding, meaning that very slowly we are, at, without trying to define understanding for, from a machine or even from a human perspective. But this difference means that uh, just that we are moving from plain manipulating language to adding information or taking information from the language manipulation. Let's say like this, uh, think about speech recognition. This has to do with machine speech to text translation and to suggestion feature. Speech recognition will never reach under percent precision. Will never because in many cases you must understand, leaving aside what is understanding, much more of what is done now, the context, the words before, our word after and so on to, to calculate probability and so on. When we transcribe something, in some cases, which counts for this four, five, six percent imprecision, and we are not 100 percent precision too, we are human, we need to understand something, what's about, to understand what was said before, to make inferences and so on. At the moment, the machine are very good, but they are stupid at all about the context of the communication. They are, they're doing translation or they're doing speech recognition, but they could do uh, um, the calculation for uh, the SpaceX uh, orbit. They don't know anything. Still, it works very well. But the, the, the new frontier is to add more context awareness. And there are quite a lot of approaches uh, going, on, going on now in the academia, in research labs, and so on, having visual uh, integration of, just for the speech recognition to disambiguate, for example, uh, staff. It's a male or a female speaking and, and so on. Another challenge is, as I told you before, is uh, that nowadays we rely on the speech recognition, which is on the cloud. But we are seeing that these language models and the deployment of these language models are becoming smaller and smaller and easier to, uh, to, to deploy. Uh, the computers are going into an acceleration of, uh, uh, think about the, the, new, the new Mac, uh, they, they launched the uh, on power processing, uh, the, 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 the new Mac with M1 processor, which is a huge leap compared to the old one. In a couple of months, they will uh, launch the M1X uh, with a huge imp improvement uh, compared to the M1. Then think about the M2 coming probably next year and Intel doing the same and so on and so on. So we are seeing, uh, uh, still in a, in a phase, it's almost incredible if you think of increasing acceleration of computational power. This will allow uh, to, to host very easily uh, these uh, language models on a normal machine, very easy to deploy and so on. A big challenge has to do with um, the, the interpreter side, which is the most challenging uh, side, if you want. And that's why I, lo I love this combination of machine and, and humans. Is that the interpreter, as I told you before, uh, is very, the idiosyncrasy of interpreters are huge. Uh, every interpreter, uh, there are common grounds, but there are so many differences. And to create a machine 
that um, are a tool that satisfy, because at the end, the goal is to satisfy not the general, the ideal interpreter, but the interpreter that's using uh, the tool provides a, a big challenge. And as soon as we will solve the first layer of challenges, uh, the technological challenges, which are more implementation challenges, and these tools, you will see these tools uh, to 2021 coming out in many uh, several products and 2022 even in more, um, would be to, to make them spot on for the single interpreter would be the next challenge. A big concern that I have about this way of technologization, a personal concern is the risk of over-reliance on technology. When I speak of over-reliance is that we know this in every aspect of our life, we are already integrated, if not physically, with machines. Uh, for many people, it's difficult to do arithmetica in, on a piece of paper, uh, for um, myself too. Um, it's difficult to, to walk through uh, unknown city without uh, a satellite system, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, uh, this is already happening. I don't know if it's bad or good. We are getting better, but we are relying on, 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 on technology for many things. We are relying on technology already now for interpreting, of course, remote interpreting. But even if you forget about remote interpreting, imagine to prepare a conference nowadays uh, or, or an event without the internet. I guess most of the people do, wouldn't know, even myself, where to start. Uh, so we already rely on this, uh, but this over reliance um, is there. If you start taking out aspects of your work with the goal of improving uh, yourself, your your performances, your time to event, uh, your quality, you end up over reliant uh, to be over reliant, and this is important. We get more powerful, better at the same time, a little bit weaker. And we should address this, uh, starting from the academia. I think it's a very important uh, topic for which I have no solution, of course. For sure, uh, there is a, our binary understanding of interpreters on the one side, which we have now, and of technology on the other side will slowly, for sure, blur. Um, this will cause uh, psychological tension and the need to redesign uh, oneself, the self. Um, it's normal, I don't want to open this topic, but it's a very fascinating topic that you can see many other professions whenever there is a revolution. It's normal. It's been in the first revolution in interpreting, moving from consecutive to simultaneous moving from pure in situ to remote, big difficulty. But this will require uh, some adaptability uh, from the profession. And uh, interpreting is not particular or different to any other aspect of life, and people will adapt. And my hope is that they will uh, use the power that it comes from technology as have been told at the beginning, for their own uh, advantage. This is now with the third wave, with the third revolution, even more important uh, than uh, before, than in the past, because we have also machine interpreting coming. So it's important that you, we see the advantages, the possibility that this gives us to keep pace, to improve, and to make uh, our role um, important and indispensable if, even in the 10, 20 years to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, here we see the, that's, uh, the silent applause. Thank you. Um, fascinating topic, of course. Um, I think I'm saying that not only selfishly, I think truly. Um, 
Uh, this was very interesting. Um, lots of probable starting points for questions. So I know it's a little bit advanced in time, but I hope nobody or you don't all have to rush away. So I, I'll quickly open it uh, very broadly and widely to questions. I will hold back myself for a minute. Anyone brave enough to make the start? Um, I think you just need to start speaking if you want to, because I don't think I can necessarily see everybody. Um, should Maybe I, I can. Go ahead then, yes. While ah, I try briefly. to get clever with um, seeing the participants who raise their hands. Go on then. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your very rich and inspiring talk. And you have provided very clear explanations of the many points, many relevant points in uh, the field of AI and machine interpreting. That's fantastic. I really like the concepts, several concepts that you have clarified in your talk just now, such as the unit of interest customization of our tools and context awareness, because all these concepts I believe are related to what to present to the interpreters when we are using the tool. So uh, my, my, my question is very, I think you probably have done this, but because this is quite new for me, so I just want to ask, and just now you mentioned the customization of the tool, either to the interpreter, to the user, or to some other parameters. What I want to know is whether, when we think of the concept of unit of interest, um, uh, may be a terminology or, or, or number or number with reference. I want to know whether you uh, can integrate the uh, parameter that in some cases or in some specific interpreting task, maybe two word cluster uh, is more frequently presented. For example, the, the rotating shaft, but in some other interpreting task, maybe three words uh, two, three word clusters are more frequently uh, presented. So I'm wondering whether when we are presenting such uh, unit of interest to the interpreters, whether we can uh, add into this parameter or it is purely statistically based. I do not know whether that makes sense. <laughs> if I understood your question uh, is uh, the length so to say of uh, the, what you call the clusters or the engrams that you are considering. And there is no uh, constraint uh, about this. Um, um, if you are interested in the selection of the information, uh, the, 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 the language model, at least what I'm using now, what we are working on uh, at the moment, uh, has no limitation. So the limitation is what you have if you opt for terminology, for example, if you opt for looking up in your glossary, which is uh, the solution that most interpreter at the moment seem to prefer, uh, just because it's a, a safe uh, a, a repository of information because you create it or you get your glossary from somebody else, from somebody, from your chef de keep or whatever. Um, and then there is no limitation or you know, whatever the length of your words are, if this is the, 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 the question. If you go for the second option, meaning complete automation, even of the uh, identification of what are the units of interest, for example, in the terminology, even though there is no uh, hard-coded uh, limitation, if not what we have done, for example, is looking at the morphology and so on the, the, of uh, specific languages, in our case of English as a starting language, and identify, identifying the common patterns of uh, terminology. So you, then, the, you write some rules and say, okay, uh, in English, uh, you have a, a high probability of have a noun, or a, a term which is noun plus noun plus noun, for example, and you look at this uh, a specific combination but there is no specific uh, restraints in this 
The only problem is that um, maybe it's related to time. The longer the term, the more uh, you have to wait, so to say, and see if you um, get the term right uh, without presenting the user with, let's, let's say, cell phone. Then phone is also a term. Cell phone is a complex if you want term and depending on how you program or you you train your uh, your language model you could have the first suggestion is a, a phone but actually was cell phone uh, the right suggestion and this causes some uh, some um, uh, uh, problems with the usability of the tools because you are presented also with a partial wrong solution but other than this there are no other concerns Oh, great, great, uh, great to know. Thank you very much for your answer. Actually, uh, sorry, University, uh, because we are now doing the dissertation and we already have a student uh, in our MA group who is researching on the use of interpreter bank. Ah. <laughs> Point of interest. <laughs> nice to know, nice to know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you me. very much. Thank you. So next question. Well, can I oh, go yeah, ahead? Ahmed, you go ahead. I'm, I have yeah. so many questions, but I, I wait. <laughs> Ahmed, sorry, sorry if my audio echoes, but my I had two particular questions. So when you were discussing suggesting AI-based uh, terms, uh, I was wondering how much of a delay uh, would be suitable for the interpreters or Within your research, have you found a suitable range of delay uh, within which the interpreter would be able to uh, clearly use that term or uh, identify those terms clearly? Yeah, thank you. This is a very, very, very interesting question. Uh, we, we did uh, very recently uh, a research uh, on, on this. Uh, an experimental research. So we created a um, lab, so to say, situation where we forced interpreters to use suggestions presented with an increasing uh, delay. Um, and we, um, our reference was the normal year voice span, span that you uh, reading literature ranging from until more, more or less five to six seconds is what people have measured, which is quite a lot of time, a long time. So we, we, we did it, and the, the, the result was that at least in the uh, situation that we did the, 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 the experiment, um, people were able to uh, integrate the solution until with a, a, a slow decrease of uh, quality, uh, until four seconds was not a problem. Uh, starting from five seconds, you can see that some subjects uh, started to decrease the quality. And we have talking about five, four to five seconds, uh, which is a very, uh, high for a machine. So uh, what we are doing now reacts in much less time than this extreme uh, span uh, that we have forced interpreters to use. So uh, what we measure was around, unfortunately, we didn't increase the, the seconds more because we have been interested when we designed the experiment to see what happens uh, if there are six, seven seconds uh, of delay uh, in this until five seconds, there were not big problems. Of course, uh, every situation is different in interpreting. Every the, the may, you may have uh, cognitive overload the sentence before. And you, uh, it's very difficult to to generalize, but it looked like uh, it was possible to at least. This is the the, the the consequence is that we could see that for the time that a normal machine looks uh, needs to to process this data. Uh, there is enough time for the interpreter to, to integrate this. Mm -hmm. uh, just to follow up on that question, uh, what kind of terms were you exactly displaying? Were they pronouns, numbers, technical information, or were they more general terms? 
this is a, <laughs> a big question, a good question because uh, it goes back to what actually user may need. Now, the idea is to display uh, what is considered by the interpreter as uh, relevant for the event, which is normally is a specialized uh, terminology. I, I guess that an interpreter will not need uh, to know how to translate cell phone, for example, and this would be only uh, 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 useless uh, distraction, but just the terminology that you um, consider mandatory or more or less mandatory or good to have uh, for a specific event, which is normally sp uh, specialized terminology. If this is coming from a database, if the other solution is just what the machine thinks is important, uh, then we have a little bit more variability. It's what the machine think is a specialized term. Other than that, we have it for uh, proper names, so city, company names, and all this stuff, and for uh, numbers. Okay, ju just, uh, just the last question to reiterate this, but uh, do you think interpreters would be able to fully trust the output or have you found any uh, techniques within your research that could sort, sort of resolve this issue of the mistrust between the interpreter and the machine? Um, this is another good question. No, uh, I don't have an answer. The only answer is uh, if you, if the tool works good, uh, and then there's a definition of what is good, uh, people will trust it. Until then, not. But this is more, the, more or less the same with a, if, if you're talking about simultaneous interpreting with, with your booth mate. Uh, if you trust your booth mate, you trust what he or she writes you. And if not, uh, you, don't, you don't trust uh, what she or he says. Um, the, the question is that for some aspects, the quality is, is good. It's not perfect. As I said before, you cannot have a 100% perfect, perfect, uh, uh, perfect level at this moment. Um, but if you ha are in some specific situation, not in every situation the tool works OK, this kind of tool works OK. If you are in a very a uh, formal situation, the tool works very good. By the way, even machine interpreting works very good at the moment. So speech to text translation in a very formal situation works very good at the moment. The, le the less formal or, or all these parameters, formality, uh, um, accents and so on, they more degradate uh, the quality. And, uh, the question will be to understand where is the threshold people trust it and use it in a psychological trust this psychological stuff and use it in a, to to have an advantage and when not and this is open i don't have an answer this is open we will see this as soon as these tools get more used and improve the question is you have to think about that at the very moment, what I show you and what you can try uh, out are very early prototype prototypes in an era where in a pre or, or a, they were at the very beginning. Now we are able to do much better inside the constraints of general constraints of the technology, um, but they will improve. The question is if the community will embrace them, because without them being embraced by the community, then there is less interest in spend money to, to create and prove them. Now they are at the stage of uh, proof of concept, but it looks like if you want, uh, in our in our SKIC experiment, we had also a survey with more than 500 uh, answers and the general um, interest was high, meaning people can see 
the advantage they can imagine also the many disadvantages or problems that has to be tackled, but the problems are there to be tackled and we will solve them at some point. Okay, La lastly, not to take more time, uh, do you, have you found any relation between the trust and the delay? So the delay in which the output is being displayed and the trust of the interpreter regarding the output, because from my own research, I have found a bit of positive correlation, but uh, these uh, sample sizes really small to definitively say yeah. so. Yeah, ah, very, very interesting uh, uh, aspect. Uh, um, I think everything which is delayed, everything that you, you know, it is like uh, uh, self-driving cars. Even if a self-driving car looks like that beside other problems and so on, but it can reduce the number of accidents and death, at least theoretically. If only one Elon Musk car crashes, the trust disappears very quickly, even if numbers would say, yeah, but you can trust it, even if there is this, it's been this accident. This is a normal psychological uh, effect. It's normal. And this is, of course, also in, in any new technology, it's also in this technology. If it's not perfect, people will not trust it at the very beginning. Yeah. And of course, uh, latency uh, is not only a, something that is not good. Uh, the, 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 if you have a latency, uh, okay, the interpreter can work even with a high lat latency, but it's not okay uh, to have a tool with a high latency. Uh, this will uh, increase, I guess, the acceptability. But you know, this is the beginning of the, no, it's not a technological uh, issue. The, the technology has, has its limitation and we have to accept also the limitations. The, que the question is the equation at the end. If the uh, at least the in a theoretical point of view, if the equation says you this helps me even with the flaws that it may have, then at some point trust or some form of trust will come. Of course, it's much does mu it's again it, it's quite interesting. Much more um, felt like bad if you say a number which is wrong because the machine suggested you something wrong is much worse than if you say the number wrong just because you understood the number wrong because it's human a machine is not allowed to to uh, to fail but it fails okay thank you so much for your time <laughs> thank you for the interesting questions and sorry if, if I can not answer all that because I'm not there. Well, you, you can are, I so you ask a question? To... Yes. Hi. Thank you, Claudia. That was really interesting. Um, I actually must say that Hamed has also raised some of my doubts as well. So thank you for answering to those. Um, I, my concern, because obviously as soon as you come with something new, uh, there's concerns because you think... Uh, of the situation and uh, my concern is really the cognitive load of the interpreter having to find out what the machine is doing um, well first of all you said obviously we have to decide what to present how to present it i would say also where to present it now now if we think uh, of the rsi we have all these platforms which are already very, uh, you know, uh, full of things and you've got the charts and the different things happening there already. And that um, is already a great um, load on, on interpreters who have to obviously rely on the technology as well. So there's a lot more now uh, that concerns uh, the interpreters while they're, they're doing their job. Um, is the actual machine going to, uh, like, is the AI going to, offer some proposal, some suggestions. So is it like, do you have more than one suggestion per term, for instance? So in that case, would the interpreter have to decide which one is the right one? And also, the trust is important because maybe if you uh, have, uh, first of all, you have to understand what is it going to, 
you know, give me as a term? Am I going to rely on this number or not? What if it gets it wrong? Um, so maybe uh, I can't actually distract myself too much because I'm not sure, you know, if, uh, if uh, I want to make a mistake a mistake okay fine but um, obviously if I rely on the machine and then the machine gives me something different because there was a problem in speech recognition or even in the machine translation uh, because as you see uh, I mean I do welcome the help especially with numbers <laughs> because uh, that was one of my um, you know weak points uh, which I've uh, had to work a lot on so it would be great for me to have all the numbers and the names and the, especially rules of people because they never that that relies a lot on first of all all the um, organizers giving you the information in advance which never happens um, and having you know enough there and also understanding this relationship which may become a lot more complicated because it's not just trusting I trust machines I do live with machines but then in certain things creativity I don't trust machines with creativity so much and uh, if I have to rely on something and then it doesn't actually work uh, then it becomes really a big overload for the interpreter yeah no, I, I perfectly agree with this um, I think the only answer can be done, can be given not by myself, but by two things. One will be research that will try to answer in a, an objective with all the problems that we can have in defining this objectivity or putting this objectivity at work or re reducing all the variable that we have in interpreting. But one answer will come from there. And at the moment, uh, the answers, preliminary answers we have is that A, it's possible to use this and B, it gives in certain context for certain kind of interpreters um, a measurable improvement of this quality. Even with all these problems that you mentioned, the fact that using this tool needs some cognitive capacity, some concentration on it. But if this comes in the overall equation, if this concentration takes out other cognitive uh, capacity that I would need in order to cope with a specific problem, the equation looks like uh, um, positive, so to say, looks like. Now we have to broaden the, the, the spectrum of research, see as we have done with the, um, the SKIC, what happens with professional uh, interpreters. And then even there, what, what happens in different situations, uh, if with different kind of talks or, 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 or of events, because maybe in some events, why should I, I don't need any suggestion. There is a more creativity act of the interpreting and there is no need of terminology. But in some other aspects, maybe this uh, terminology is so key and it will make a big difference if I'm using always strategies or whatever and generalize and say, uh, yeah, that component of the car, and I don't say the clutch because I don't know how to say it in Russian, makes a, may make a big difference. This variability is what we have to, to look at. So what, what, and this should be done by, by academia, also expanding the, 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 the topic, uh, the, the setting, not only conference interpreting, but also the other aspects, uh, other settings of interpreting. And the second will come from uh, the users. When these kind of tools will be available, and they will be, they will be available also, of course, in the remote simultaneous or remote interpreting or as a standalone uh, and so on, people will start to work with them. And I can tell you at the very beginning, you will have two different kind of reactions. The people that will be enthusiastic because they are able to concentrate only on the positive sides and leave aside the negative sides. And then you will have the others 
that we see the negative sides, the shortcomings that will be there. And they say, no, we don't, uh, don't, I don't want to use it. But this will be the long process I, will, I was pointing to at the very beginning that this emergence of this technology will not be, I give you the perfect tool tomorrow and everything will be changed from tomorrow on. It will be a long process of improvement, errors, and so on. But it's a process that is uh, never ending, if you want, process. If there is interest by the community, this will go on. If there is no interest, this will stop. Is the community uh, that has to decide is it, if it's better to stop or not to stop? My take is that it will not stop because the, some of the advantages will, uh, will be obvious. And again, it will be just, uh, if, if I show you a tool like this, it looks like a big change. But in my eyes, it's just a small tool. It's just a, imagine a small pop-up in your computer that you look only for, oh, that term was important. And I look, ah, yeah, the term is a register there out of your glossary uh, of these. It's just a small, as for me, a small add-on like my add-on on Skype or the messenger, uh, what's the name, WhatsApp, that I discovered with the new version, I changed my phone couple of weeks ago, I live in a country where I speak very badly the language, and uh, I discovered that I could translate in real time, tip in my, my WhatsApp message, and with my understanding of the target language, could change my, uh, my source language and, and communicate with a clamp now, or I know what's called the, 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 the the, the, the yeah. worker, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. The worker that has to come <laughs> to my, <laughs> yeah, thank you for the live dictionary. It's a small, small feature, but it changes a lot. And this is more or less the same way to look at this. And about, and I conclude about your terminology. Um, as I said before, the first feature that you will see, because this is what uh, people uh, like you uh, are asking, is quality of these suggestions. So the, the first. Uh, uh, things that you will see would be like a, a SDL Trados or a memo queue uh, terminology, a part where you have your own terminology coming up automatically. And this will happen here. So you know it is my terminology and I can trust it. And after a couple of months, you will see that there will pop up also some other terms that are not your terminology and they will be shown maybe in a different color, pay attention. You heard the name of this fish. I thought I was a fish, says to you, the machine with this color. And I'm proposing you this translation. You're the linguist, decide. You prefer to say just a fish, or you prefer to say this because you recollect maybe from your long-term memory, ah, this was the name uh, that the name you were saying. But this is how I see things coming. So do you see this machine picking up just in the first phase, the terminology that like I have obviously requested? So for instance, yeah. would I just request proper names and technology, yes, you know, all the terms for me? So only those terms will be picked up yeah. and displayed yeah. by the machine. Absolutely. And in just one suggestion then, or is it going to be multiple suggestions for a term or for uh, yeah, a sentence, yeah. would that be a sentence? It's just to understand better, because yeah, obviously uh, I do welcome the help, <laughs> just uh, in, the, in the first phase it's going to be, as you said, it's going to yeah, be a yeah, help, yeah. but also work, abs abs more abs work. Ab absolutely. Um, no, no, I, I think it would be, I, I don't know, I, I cannot say what other are implementing at the moment. I, I would say it would be, um, one, if the machine knows, is the highest probable one or more mimicking actually what you do. I don't know, you interpret or not, not you personally, when you are in the booth and open up Lingui or another dictionary and uh, in, in uh, and look up because you are 
extremely in need of this recurring term that has come up uh, 10 times before. And you always say the fish, but your listener won't know what is the fish they are going to eat uh, uh, at the restaurant <laughs> to, to, tonight. Um, and you look up in Lingue and then see different uh, suggestions. And then you pick up the one that works for your context. I think it's something that people already do now. now in a manual, in an old-fashioned way. I see always people uh, tipping in on the computer. This is just a, a way to automate, to make it automatic. So another big change in this in this respect. Thank just you. A, yeah, but definitely. a quantum leap uh, in the in the automation. Very exhaustive answer. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much. We have some sort of in-depth <laughs> answers here. That is really good. Um, I think this will remain the, well, a spiral that might not be the right metaphor, but this, this relationship between uptake and trust, I think is a complex one and um, that, that will, well, it's there to stay certainly. And um, yeah, I think uh, probably it is a little more complex than looking at the other revolutions that you have um, outlined, you know, where even with remote interpreting, I think this kind of um, trust uh, um, uptake relationship and tensions are still ongoing and um, for whatever, I mean, right or wrong reasons is another question, but they are still there. And I guess this will, as you say, with every new technology, but certainly we see the potential of this, I guess, um, as a, to come back to the beginning here um, as a tool for interpreters and to, to alleviate maybe cognitive load as much as it might raise it, but I like your sort of look at the equation of it and in terms of it. What certainly my take is from this also that um, we do need a lot more research in this area to yeah. to explore all the different variables and the different settings where this could be used and how it pans out. Um, so a lot of food for thought. Um, I think I will draw it to a close now. Um, if, uh, well, some people had to drop out, I saw some, but I saw some lovely thank you messages to you. So they, they all go to you. I hope you see them all. Um, Thank you very much for joining us. It was lovely to see you again. And uh, well, I hope we see you again for uh, before too long, is this. <laughs> Thanks for Absolutely. joining us and for the presentation. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Okay, bye.